So I have been tasked with talking about a world beyond racism, a world after racism, a world without racism. And when I was posed this challenge, I was really, truly stumped because I have never imagined my life without racism. And I, I don't think anyone in this room can imagine their lives without racism. It's like, you know, the bad boyfriends of your life that you keep coming back to. It's kind of like supporting Spurs. Um, only, only, I, only I reckon, like, ultimately racism is a little bit more successful. <laughs> Just uh, some self-loathing there. And what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to do that really annoying thing where I go like, oh, Miriam Webster defines racism as because that's boring as shit. Instead, what I'm going to do is tell you a bit about how it feels. Or, or better yet, better yet, we've got like at least six ethnic minorities in this room. <laughs> yes, I can see one in the back. Hands up. No, 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 not, not that much. It'll start all the white folks. <laughs> so, ethnic minorities in the room. Can I see by show of hands, how many of you growing up got called smelly? Got called smelly? How many of you got compared unfavorably to food smells? Got called hairy? Yep. Uh, how many of you were compared to feces, perhaps? Anyone compared to feces? Is that just me? Okay. Moving swiftly on. How many of you were made to feel ashamed of your home? Of the way your family spoke? How many of you were made to feel that you would never be as harmonious, as clean, or as beautiful as your white schoolmates? Everyone in this room. In all things, to be a person of color living here in the global north is to be made to feel like dirt. And I'm not just talking about feeling shitty, I'm not just talking about feeling sad, I'm talking about an intimate bodily relationship with the soil and indeed the soiled. What I'm saying is that to exist as a person of color is to exist as a social contaminant. And as the anthropologist Mary Douglas has said, dirt is matter out of place. And how strange it is that race, that taxonomy, which sought to pin down skin tone to continental origin, makes itself known most sharply when out of place, at the contact zone of what Fanon called the system of compartments which make up the colonial world, the dividing line, the frontiers, which speak the language of pure force. The language of pure force, from the French paratroopers storming the Casbah in 1957, to the Briggs Plan of Malaysia. Anyone heard about the Briggs Plan? I was reading about the Briggs Plan this week. Nope. Just a bit of light reading uh, about the Briggs Plan, was where half a million Malaysians were forcibly displaced and uh, put into essentially concentration camps by the British in the 1950s. The, the colonial ordering of the world made itself known through barbed wire. And yet, at other times, white supremacy was poured upon the contact zone, like bleach upon the colonized body, in inexorable, clinical, caustic. But before I bond you out too much, memory, as well, is a kind of matter out of place. And no matter how whitewashed the history we're taught at school or at university or from Mary Beard or from James Butler, <laughs> <laughs> there's always that disorderly voice, some scrap of a story, half remembered maybe, staining the bleached pages of your history books. And for me, it was my grandmother. My grandmother telling me about her own histories of dirt. The fact that she came to this country at 17 was cleaning up after people in hospitals. Or her father, who was um, imprisoned for sedition against the British in Bengal at the height of the famine. He had to literally fashion food out of dirt from rotting peelings, etc. He was a real magician. And he dealt with dirt, like so many of us, in order to stay alive. And so Kojo Karam, who is excellent, a friend of Navarra, you should read his work, he's the best. He called this um, a transnational model of identity. But instead, I want to call it dirty epistemology. <laughs> dirty epistemology is kebab shop knowledge. It's <laughs> It's mini cab knowledge. It's Auntie G saw you at the bus stop with a boy knowledge. It's hood knowledge. It's street knowledge. It's half factual, but almost entirely true knowledge. And I think that it is this particular kind of hood knowledge, this dirty epistemology, which can subvert as well as um, help us survive the conditions in which we live. Dirty epistemology is what takes us from mourning to desiring subjects. And if you want to know what I mean by desiring subjects, you could do worse than listen to Kendrick Lamar backseat freestyle. 
All I want, all my life, I want money and power. So, five years in power. How do we get that money, brown people? What do we do with five years in the pristine corridors of parliament? It seems to me that the fatal flaw of multiculturalism, in addition to the garbage fire that is Trevor Phillips' race politics, was to insist that, we, that the inherent dignity of people of color would somehow magically be recognized on the basis of some shared human understanding. No such shared human understanding has ever existed, but that doesn't mean that it can't. Anti-racism is at heart a utopian demand. And so rather than being recognized as human, I now demand to be recognized as dirt, as dirt that is claiming its place. So what does that mean to claim a sense of place? I think that there are three aspects to it, the urban, the border, and the prison. Any anti-racist movement is by definition an urban movement, and I think that that's been exemplified nowhere better than the Justice for Grenfell movement. And we can have a load of demands about protecting our limited st um, stock of social housing or building more social housing, but I think that there needs to be a much more foundational and simple demand, simple bordering on idiotic, that no person can be forcibly removed from a place which they call home. No evictions, no foreclosures, no increases in rent that don't keep up with your pay, no shipping containers magically turned into cocktail bars next door. I mean, not that that necessarily keeps you out, etc. And maybe we need to re-interrogate re what the state is for in the city. Before, the state was merely the custodian of managed decline, organized social abandonment, whereas now it can do things like support community land bids, in which housing and the generation of, um, of truly affordable housing is itself a political act. And the right to place, this right to place means no more deportations. In five years, we can shut down detention centers. We can process all claims in the community. We can even move away from this whole shambles of citizenship towards residency. Why can't you have rights simply because you're here? Why can't you? Does that make sense to any of you? Yeah. Makes no fucking sense to me. Right. We can get rid of no recourse to public funds overnight if we want to do, and it'd still be cheaper than detaining and deporting people. Still be more affordable to the taxpayers, it's just people really like racism, so that's why they don't do it. <laughs> and finally, on this theme of the social contaminant, we must empty our prisons. And by this, I don't just mean the physicality of prisons, like Pentonville. I'm not just talking about Wandsworth Prison, I'm also talking about the structures that immiserate people, like on probation, that keep them from seeking work, that keep them from being happy. And emptying prisons also means disempowering the police. It has to. Too many young black men in this city have died following police contact, and there has not been one single successful conviction of a police officer. And what does that do? That robs mothers of their sons, wives of their husbands, sisters of their brothers, and it can't go on anymore. We thought that 2011, the riots, which also took place not that far from here, would have to be some kind of breaking point. In fact, what we saw was the failures of insurrection in many ways, and the brutal truth that life will drag on regardless, pretty much unchanged, only people will be more dispersed. And I think another simple demand is that the families of those who have lost people to the state should be able to have the power to call for an independent, um, investigation of that death. They should have the power to remove officers from active duty. I don't understand why this is not the case. And so I guess to sum up, because I guess I've bummed you all out like a little bit, and I'm sorry, that's because racism is really sad. It's for the first time in my political life, I feel truly hopeful that some portion of these things might be achieved within my lifetime. I grew up thinking that racism was an immovable object in political life, that it was unchanging, and it would just be this lodestone that I would wear around my neck until I die. It doesn't have to be that way. And I think that we need to trust ourselves a lot more to map out a racism, which is, oh, sorry, an anti-racism, which is shit. <laughs> anti-racism, that's the one we like, anti-racism, which is essentially future orientated and no longer about haunting and the past and morning. Thank you. <laughs>